Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well and are keeping safe uh, in these challenging times. Uh, I'm David Chan, a professor of psychology at the Singapore Management University. Uh, I want to first start by thanking our organizers uh, for inviting me to address you at this global conference regarding technology and measurement uh, to share with you my views and also some of my experiences in Singapore. Uh, I understand that we have a diverse audience here, so I will keep my remarks general and non-technical. Uh, in this short 10 minute session that I have with you. I think many of us, uh, as you are researchers or practitioners, I think we believe that technology, when used properly, uh, they can help us better measure the various constructs of interest, the various phenomena of interest. And therefore, we are then able to better understand, better predict, and also influence these constructs and this phenomenal of interest. Uh, of course, with the ultimate purpose of uh, trying to address the social and behavioral issues that matter to all of us. Um, so what I want to do is to share with you some of my views very briefly and some of my experiences in Singapore, because I think they show both uh, some of the challenges, uh, some of the opportunities that are probably also applicable elsewhere uh, outside Singapore, perhaps uh, manifested a bit differently, uh, so that we can all together try to integrate uh, these uh, advances in technology as measurement specialists. Uh, and also the insights from the social behavioral sciences to address the various issues that you and I care about. I think uh, many of our issues and our experiences, at least in Singapore, I tend to think of them in terms of what I call the three C's. Uh, the first C is about context, the second C is about changes, and the third C is about collaborations. Uh, so these three C's, context, changes, and collaboration, uh, they are about technology and management, of course. Uh, the three Cs were pretty salient and pretty critical uh, in how we in Singapore uh, deal with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and I think moving forward, also how we're going to navigate the post-pandemic uh, realities. Uh, now, of course, I won't have time to go into details on uh, the COVID-19 situation in Singapore. And uh, those of you who are interested to take a look at my book, uh, Combating the Crisis, that's the title. Uh, in which I discussed the psychology of Singapore's response to COVID-19. So what I want to do here is to share the three Cs with you. Uh, the first C, we call that it is about context. Uh, I think as scientists uh, and as practitioners, uh, we are all better prepared. Uh, and I think we can continue to contribute and even more significantly so uh, if we understand the context of the issues that matter to people uh, and to the different stakeholders involved and also how the different parts of the contextual systems are interdependent, uh, how they relate uh, to each other. Now, of course, this contextual understanding must not be just a motherhood statement. Uh, it is really about adequate knowledge, about uh, involving knowing realistically, knowing proactively, how the various technological innovations, uh, applications in areas such as uh, social media, uh, online communication, digital transactions, artificial intelligence, uh, big data analytics, how the advances in these areas that actually they have transformed the way that uh, businesses, the way that governments, organizations, and also individuals, how they operate, uh, how they deliver their services, uh, how they live their lives. And I think this transformation in terms uh, has significantly affected, uh, and I think they will continue to affect uh, people's lives, people's livelihoods, their way of life, and their quality of life. And these technological effects, I think they translate into practical impact on people's well-being and people's functioning at multiple levels, uh, be it at the individual, the group, uh, organization, or society. And I tend to think of these critical contextual issues, uh, they tend to revolve around what I call the three I's, uh, industries, innovation, and individuals. Uh, why industries? Right? Industries, because we need to understand how the technology has actually helped uh, or hindered the various sectors, the various businesses, uh, the, how these effects uh, may be different, uh, and how we can then see uh, these effects operating in our real lives. And we see that very clearly in the effects of COVID-19. Uh, and moving forward, uh, how these effects are going to manifest post-COVID, uh, I think will very much depend on how the countries, uh, various countries handle their COVID uh, contextual situation. I think innovation, that's the second eye. Uh, uh, of course, uh, adaptability and resilience, they will also become critical concepts and critical capabilities. Uh, and the issue then is how in this context we can integrate technology and measurement to enhance uh, at all levels of analysis uh, uh, in order to improve our understanding of uh, what technology enabled measurement could do for us. 
Uh, and of course, we need to focus on the individuals. Uh, so our policies, our interventions, they need to be people-centric. You need to put individuals at the core. And I think those who are able to do so will tend to be the ones that will survive and the ones that will thrive uh, even post-COVID. Now, the context that I talk about uh, in terms of uh, the industries, in terms of innovations, about people-centric, uh, focusing on the individuals, I think for us to do all these, we kind of need an ecosystem to support these substantial developments in these various issues. And again, I tend to think of them in terms of three eyes. Uh, what is the infrastructure? What are the institutions that we have? And uh, what about the implementation? How are we going to do uh, to execute uh, what you have designed and what you have formulated? Uh, why these are important, uh, I tend to look back at the experience we have in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, we have uh, made very huge uh, national investments in what we call RIEC. Right? That is about research, innovation, enterprise, uh, commercialization. Uh, and we tend to adopt a whole of society approach in our attempt to try to encourage the different industrial sectors and businesses uh, to pivot, uh, to transform uh, in, uh, in the light of uh, what COVID has done to all of us. Um, and then we have uh, smart nation strategies that many of you might have heard about in Singapore. Uh, that was critical uh, in the way that we did our contact tracing. Uh, we were able to shorten the contact tracing period uh, that used to be totally manual. Uh, and now uh, with the technology of having a particular app, uh, having tokens that are able to use Bluetooth technology in order to map up the proximity of individuals uh, who might be together uh, uh, in uh, public places in order to aid contact tracing. Well, of course, with all these, they're taking into account privacy concerns and so on. And the technology uh, and were able to help us to measure some of these developments, uh, able to actually make a real world difference in terms of our contact tracing. And that for the past one year, I think has helped us a lot in containing the COVID-19 situation. Of course, right now, as I speak uh, with uh, variants uh, in uh, various places, variants in various places of the virus, uh, uh, we tend to see uh, waves coming back again and all countries uh, need to be very careful uh, and not be complacent just because you have some uh, advanced technology to do your contact tracing and so on. Um, but what I think COVID has done for all of us in terms of technology and measurement is that it actually has uh, accelerated some of these uh, smart nation uh, innovations uh, and adoption of technology. And I think with that in mind, uh, as measurement specialists, uh, all of us have to be a bit cognizant of the multi-dimensional impact that technology actually has uh, on the various uh, contexts, uh, whether it is in the areas of uh, health, in the areas of economy, uh, areas of work, or sustainable living, because uh, as we recover from COVID, uh, we need to kind of uh, recover in a sustainable manner, I think. Uh, and of course, uh, mental health, uh, all of us uh, have uh, actually experienced, or we know somebody who has experienced uh, some form of other mental health issues uh, throughout this uh, period of uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, I'm, on a member, I'm a member of the Social Science Research Council in Singapore. That's the national council that uh, Michelle grants uh, and try to also uh, affect uh, the development of uh, talent in the social and behavioral sciences in Singapore. So as an institution, uh, one of the things that we focus on is to ensure that the grants that come to us uh, when they talk about being multidisciplinary, when they talk about you know, using technology and social behavioral sciences, uh, we do spend quite a lot of time in trying to figure out uh, whether you are truly trying to integrate social and behavioral sciences uh, and technology in a way that are able to actually address real world issues, to solve problems, and of course, to add to theoretical insights. Um, so I think uh, for all of us, in order to advance our science and our practice of uh, technology enabled measurement, uh, and to make positive contributions, uh, it is quite important for us to understand uh, within our own country's context, the technological innovations that are going on, the capabilities, uh, our own country's uh, relevant national strategies, as well as uh, how the different stakeholders, uh, how they are interdependent and how they interrelate to each other. So that's the context. Uh, the second C that I want to share with you about is the notion of changes. Uh, of course, the, in psychology and in uh, various disciplines in the social sciences, uh, a lot has been spoken and uh, written about how the technological transformation, how the related uh, rapidly evolving changes, how they have all led to both uh, adaptability demands that are quite new, uh, and they also bring with us some new aspirational goals and opportunities for individuals, for groups, uh, and for societies. 
But I think in contrast, uh, you will notice that uh, less attention has been given to the emerging issues in uh, research, in policy, in practice, concerning how to use this technological uh, enabled uh, measurement of the various psychological constructs and processes that you and I are familiar with. Um, and by that, I mean what exactly is happening and what are the effects uh, when we have technology enabled measurement uh, in terms of uh, their effects on the way we understand causal effects, the way we understand temporal dynamics uh, or other types of changes on how people think, how people feel and how people act. And I so I think uh, we all need to focus a little bit more, uh, give a little bit more efforts uh, in terms of examining the nature of the technology enabled data uh, and uh, they, the, the technology enabled tools that we talk about. The question I have is really about how this technology enabled approach uh, to the way that we produce data, the way we collect, analyze, interpret and use the various types of data and data sets how do they actually relate to the important conceptual and methodological issues uh, in psychological measurement? And in order to understand that well, in order to do something positive about it, I think uh, as social and behavioral scientists that most of you are, uh, we need to actually understand the various data types that exist, the various data sets that have existed, let's say in the past decade or so. Uh, these could be data that you and I are not so familiar with traditionally uh, because of the way that we are trained in our graduate school and the way that our disciplines have uh, evolved. Now, think about the data sets and the data types in uh, business and consumer patterns. Of course, many of us are familiar with uh, delivery of food, uh, getting a, a vehicle through, a, through an app and so on, getting a public transport. Uh, what are some of these data that are very dynamic uh, that are involved right, in the areas of uh, transport, in the areas of uh, infrastructure, uh, gaining access to amenities? Uh, what about the environment of uh, climate change uh, and other kinds of sustainability issues? What about the data sets on changes in the way that we do our education? Uh, all of us are on Zoom now, but there can be hybrid uh, a kind of uh, arrangements, uh, how that has affected the way we train our, our, our younger generations in terms of uh, taking over us uh, as scholars uh, for the next generation. Uh, and what about the effects on jobs, effects on health? Uh, what about crowd movements? Uh, what about public sentiments on social media? Now, all these are various data sets and data types uh, that frankly speaking, uh, most of us are not very used to because they are quite recent. Uh, they are quite uh, familiar to people in computer sciences, uh, technology and so on, but perhaps less uh, familiar to some of us. So it is quite important for us to understand the data sets, but also to understand the technology, the analytics that are involved, uh, such as those dealing with uh, user characteristics, with tax uh, recommendation system, network analysis, sensor, uh, spatial temporal issues and so on. And frankly speaking, uh, what we really need to do a better job in is how to understand how these various technologies can help us in terms of sensing and detection. Uh, because unlike our traditional confirmatory approaches, uh, you do not start off with a model very often. You start off with having uh, tons and tons of data and their dynamic. Uh, we then are left with the job of trying to sense and detect what happened. So what we need to do is to actually have a better contribution in terms of impact analysis. How do we identify patterns, understand, predict, influence these emergent patterns and do our dynamic modeling properly over time? Um, because of time, uh, let me just end with the final C that I want to talk about, which is really about collaborations. Uh, I know that many of us uh, have heard this uh, thousands and millions of times that, oh, we need to be multidisciplinary in our approach. And you find that when we apply for grants these days, uh, you make sure you put people from different disciplines uh, onto your grants uh, as your co-PIs. Um, I just want to say uh, and remind all of us that a multidisciplinary approach is not about multiple disciplines per se. It is really an approach that is about uh, being interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary in the way we look at our problems. Because uh, the problems in our real world, as you and I know, they are not compartmentalized uh, into the formal disciplines that uh, you and I organize knowledge, that you and I are trained uh, formally to become experts in our field. Um, I think with that, then uh, there is a need for us to re-look re at our education model, uh, the way we train our PhDs. Uh, are we really uh, leaving the scientist practitioner model that uh, many of us talk about? I think uh, it is important to remind us that uh, good science can actually solve practical problems 
and uh, adequate practice in the real world, uh, real advanced scientific progress. And of course, to do this, uh, we need to first understand the different paradigms that the people from different disciplines hold, uh, giving a chance for us to recognize that actually there are some things that are common across disciplines, uh, how they can complement each other, and that requires us to do a little bit of perspective taking. Uh, and I think it needs a psychological mindset in all of us uh, that I often call it the HLC. Uh, that is, you must first have the humility uh, and the learning orientation, and then you can talk about the collaboration, right, HLC. Humility, because uh, it is quite important for us to revisit our assumptions, especially those of us who are experts uh, trained for many years in our discipline. I think the more expert we are, uh, the less likely we are going to acknowledge that we could be wrong uh, and to listen to someone that is a novice to your discipline, but maybe an expert in other disciplines. So having that humility uh, to revisit our assumptions, to avoid our own confirmatory biases, having that learning orientation is pretty important. And I think if we have humility and if we have that learning orientation, it is quite possible to collaborate and to make positive contributions. Well, I think uh, this is a brief session of 10 minutes. And I hope that what I've done is given you some quick food for thought uh, and focusing on the three C's that I talk about, uh, the context, the changes and collaborations. And I hope this can sort of provide all of us a roadmap if not at least a heuristic uh, or a springboard in order to contribute uh, to technology and labor measurement in a way that uh, we can really make a positive difference to ourselves and also to others around us. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and please continue to keep safe. Uh, and I wish you all well uh, in this challenging time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh,